Okay, in this video, we are going to dig deeply into flip-flops and in particular, the timing requirements. So fundamentally, what a flip-flop is, is it's the, it's the fundamental element of sequential logic. And let's get a pointer here. Um, basically, when a rising clock edge comes along, copy whatever is at the data input over to the output as such. And um, as we go through this, we're going to ask ourselves uh, the, these questions. How soon before that clock edge does the data have to be present or set up? How long after the clock edge does the data need to be held? And then after the clock edge, how long does it take for the data to propagate from the data input to the Q output? So a little um, a closer view of the uh, of these timing relationships here. So what I've shown here is that same flip-flop again. I've got a clock coming into the clock input, and I've got some data into the data input that is showing up at the output sometime later. So here is the setup time. So before my required setup time, the data can do whatever it wants. It can be high, it can be low, uh, ideally not tri-state, but um, you know, maybe the data is being presented or received by another device that's receiving a different clock, for example. Um, and then at the clock edge, my data is copied from, the clock edge is, is really where, I, so I need to set up before that clock edge, and then um, I need to hold the data for some time after the clock edge as well. And then at that clock edge, the data, the data, high data will propagate to the Q output. Okay, and then so after the hold time requirement is met, my data can do whatever it wants, uh, can also do whatever it wants on the falling clock edge, because this flop in particular is only sensitive to rising edges. And then over here, I'm setting up with with a zero data instead of a one data. And uh, I meet my setup time requirements, I've got a rising clock edge, a zero propagates to the output. And then after my hold time requirement is met, my data can do whatever it wants again. Okay, and here's a preview of my favorite interview question. And uh, so what that question is, what happens if I take a flip-flop and I short the data and clock together and apply a square wave? What shows up at the output? So we're going we're gonna to answer that question. Okay, and so why do we care so much about flip-flops? Well, um, anything that stores a digital state has a flip-flop or latch somewhere. Um, and SRAM is a great example. It's a bunch of individually addressable flip-flops. And then a microprocessor is a bunch of flip-flops that are wrapped with digital logic and control. And of course, a, an FPGA or field programmable gate array, um, again, it's a, it's a sea of programmable logic and uh, registers and flops. Um, the MC14500 is a one-bit micro microprocessor, essentially, here. And what I like about this is you know, we've got all the uh, typical blocks we'd see in a microprocessor. We've got a logic unit. We've got some inputs and outputs. And here, the result register is a single D-type flip-flop. And uh, yes, you can play video games on this thing. Um, I'll, I'll put a link to this, uh, this video in the description. Okay, you can also buy them as discrete components. So the 7474 is what we'll be looking at. Um, the X indicates that there's a bunch of different families with different characteristics, uh, TTL and CMOS, low voltage CMOS, etc. Um, the 7474 is a dual flip-flop with a couple of extra features. Uh, the 74109 is a JK flip-flop. And the 74273 is an octal D flip-flop. And um, if you've looked at old computer hardware, uh, particularly uh, you know, early, late 70s, early 80s uh, microcomputers, you'll often see fields and fields of 273 latches. And what these guys do is you present an 8-bit byte of data on, uh, on 8 pins, and at the rising clock edge, the data is copied to the Q output and held. Okay, another reason why we care so much is um, when whenever you're interfacing a uh, controller device of some sort to a peripheral de device of some sort. So uh, typical example, I've got a microcontroller, you know, maybe it's got a built in analog to digital converter, but it's not very good. And so I want to have an external high performance device, you'll often connect those devices with a spy interface or some other form of clocked interface. And these interfaces are strings of flip flops. So in the case of a spy interface, I've got what's called a shift register. So I've got the data from from one flip-flop uh, 
I've, I've got the Q output from one going to data of the next, Q output of one to data of the next. And then I can extend that chain of flops across two different chips here. Now, here's where things get interesting because this data into this device, I've got to meet setup and hold time requirements. Um, so the controller device has its set of requirements and the peripheral or target device has its own set of requirements here. And then inside the device itself, um, on the rising edge of this chip select signal, all that does is it copies the data from this register into another register. So um, all of these things are extensions of that, that single flip-flop device. Um, and each device, the controller and the target, has its own timing requirements that look an awful lot like we just described. You'll see setup time and hold time. So data valid to S clock edge setup and hold time. Uh, this is with respect to the target device, this AD7124 A to D converter. And boy, didn't we just look at this diagram. I've got an active clock edge and I've got a time that the data has to be set up before the edge and a time that it has to be held. Uh, in this case, it's uh, 30 nanoseconds and 25 nanoseconds, respectively. And then on the controller side of things, uh, very, very similar here. I've the data that's coming from the target device into the controller. Uh, I have a setup time of five nanoseconds and a hold time. Uh, this is kind of interesting. The hold time is expressed in terms of the master clock frequency uh, of the device here. And you know, similar timing diagram. I've got a setup time and a hold time uh, shown on this diagram here. And when I connect one device to another, all timing requirements for both devices have to be simultaneously met. Um, in FPGA land, uh, you've got more knobs or more uh, a finer degree of control in the form of timing constraints. And uh, this is a, a language or a, um, a, a set of requirements that tell the FPGA tool, whether it's Cardis or Vivado or, or one of the other vendors tools, it tells the tools, the tool, what is the peripherals timing requirement? And uh, it will try like crazy to meet those requirements and let you know if it can't. Um, wonderful book on, uh, on the subject here. Um, and it, it's filled with diagrams like this, you know, different situations of one flip-flop going, whose output goes through some logic with some delay, uh, clocking another flip-flop and, you know, selectors and all kinds of stuff like this. Um, and then this uh, is, you know, gets scarier and scarier. Multi-cycle path constraints, you know, what happens when data is clocked in, not at the, at one clock edge, but the following. Um, you, you get the idea, this is a, a pretty deep subject here, uh, but again, that is a rabbit hole for another day. Okay, so back to our humble symbol, uh, our humble single flip-flop here. Um, quick refresher on the 74HC74. Uh, in addition to the data clock and Q output, it's also got a complementary output and these handy uh, reset and set pins as well. So if I want to force the, the flop into a known state, I can assert one of these signals here. And then if you dig into the data sheet, you'll see the same diagrams. You'll see a setup and hold time requirement. So you know, clock rising edge, I've got to set the data up for some amount of time. Before the edge, I've got to hold it afterwards. And on that clock edge, I have some propagation delay from the edge to the data being valid. Um, you'll notice here it's broken out into two separate numbers, the propagation delay from low to high and from high to low. Um, so many times those numbers are identical in the data sheet, uh, but not always. Um, if nothing else, this is a reminder that they're not necessarily identical. There may be some skew from high to low and low to high. Okay, and so to get a feel for what those numbers are or the magnitudes of those numbers, I have um, taken a look at the five leading manufacturers of 74HC74 flip-flops and uh, tabulated the data here. Um, a couple of things to notice here. The devices have a fairly wide operating voltage range here, and the timing requirements change with supply voltage. They tend to get slower at lower voltages here. Um, another fairly obnoxious thing, if you're operating at 
a 3.3 volt supply is they're not actually guaranteed exactly at 3.3 volts. Um, you have to kind of interpolate and, and do a little bit of engineering guesswork uh, between 4.5 and 2 volts here. Um, let's see, what else do we notice? We notice that there's a pretty big disparity. Like if we look at the setup time at 6 volts, uh, my setup time, my minimum is 13 nanoseconds, but typically 2. Uh, again, engineering judgment. If you build a circuit and you give it 3 nanoseconds of of setup time, and it works 99% of the time, but one time out of 100 it fails, um, don't phone up NXP because they'll tell you, you have to give it 13 nanoseconds in order to guarantee that it operates properly. Um, looking at the hold time, there's things are get a little more interesting here. If I look at this NXP uh, hold time requirement, it's three nanoseconds minimum. So the clock edge happens, I must hold the data for three nanoseconds. But typically, I must hold it for negative six nanoseconds. What in the world does that mean? Um, that quite literally means that I can set up my data, I can change my data two nanoseconds before the clock edge, and it will still be latched in properly. Um, again, it's it's hard to picture that without uh, you know seeing it on an oscilloscope, and, and we'll try to get a look at that. Um, but something that is a little bit more easy to swallow first is the idea of zero hold time. So these three manufacturers, ST, Fairchild, Toshiba, the, their devices are guaranteed to only require zero nanoseconds of hold time. And the way to interpret that is that the data and the clock can change simultaneously. And that's actually super handy in a lot of situations uh, that we'll get into here. So quite literally, I can set up a zero on my data, a clock edge can come in and my data can change to the next bit at exactly the same time. These devices are guaranteed to clock in a uh, to clock in the data that was present at the rising edge, and that should give you a hint to one of the possible answers for my favorite interview question. So what happens if we just barely violate the timing requirements of a flip-flop? So we're just on the edge of clocking in a zero or a one. And uh, these pictures are from a couple of resources that are out on the internet, and I'll provide links in the description here. Um, and this little diagram should give you a hint about uh, about what we might see. Um, so you know, this is a, a typical metastable situation where, yeah, the output might hang sort of somewhere in the middle. Eventually, it's going to settle to a zero or one. And here's a scope shot from a wonderful lecture uh, from uh, Dr. Daly at Stanford here, and I'll post a link to this as well. So this is a uh, scope shot of a falling edge clock followed by a data transition that sort of hangs in the middle and then sometimes uh, settles out to a one and then sometimes it settles out to a zero. So we'll do our own version of that in a second. Okay, so um, our next steps here are we're going to design some circuits in LT Spice and look at some ideal behavior. Uh, but of course, uh, LT Spice is not reality, so we're going to build up our circuits and then finally test them. So let's take a look at the operation of a flip-flop in LT Spice. And uh, one thing to note about the flip-flops in LT Spice is that these are ideal devices here. So um, they, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what the exact setup and hold time requirements are, but that's something that we don't really have control over. Um, so what do we have control over? So if I look at the component editor here, I can specify parameters like the high voltage, the fall time, the rise time, the delay through the device, and a reference voltage. So this is a, a threshold uh, where the input is interpreted as a zero versus a one. So um, you know, here I'm working with five volt logic, so I set my reference voltage to two and a half. Um, and I can also specify my output resistance here. So uh, this is unrealistically low. Um, I just put one ohm uh, arbitrarily here. And so let's look at, at our circuit here. So I have um, I've connected a couple of different flip flops, and you'll, we'll we'll see why in a minute here. Um, first, let's focus on let's focus on the easy one here. So what I've done on this lower flip flop is I take a clock signal and I feed the Q bar output back into the input. So this is a very common circuit for uh, dividing a clock by two. So if I have a um, well. 
whatever comes in, uh, whatever clock frequency comes in, I basically get half of that frequency at the output here. And so that's handy as a reality check. And, and it's also handy for looking at the propagation delay through a flip-flop. We can look at both rising and falling edges. Um, and then on the upper side here is, uh, I've set this one up so that I can play with the timing relationship between the clock and the data. And so let's look at these uh, pulse sources that I have here. So these are, you know, pulses and um, how I've set those up, the initial voltage is zero, the on voltage is five volts, and I've parameterized the delay um, wh where it starts from. And, and I did that so it's a little bit easier to read in the schematic. Um, I've set a very fast rise time and fall time of arbitrarily about 100, or not about, but exactly 100 picoseconds, an on time or a high time of one microsecond and a period of 10 microseconds or 100 kilohertz. And identical for V2. So everything's identical except I've parameterized the delay as clock delay. Okay, so here what I've done, if we look at how I've set this initial simulation up, I have a data delay of a picosecond. So effectively, no, that's just a, you know, a small number that isn't zero. Um, and then a clock delay of one nanosecond. And let's look at that in simulation. Um, oh, and one other thing here is I have purposely reset the devices to zero. So I've connected the clear pins of these devices um, up to a, a uh, piecewise linear uh, source here, and we'll see what that looks like right now. Okay, so if we look at the output, um, I've got the, uh, the, the the clear signal is this, this teal color here. So it starts out at five volts, clearing the flip-flops and then it uh, and then it transitions to zero and stays there for the rest of the simulation. And uh, let's give ourselves an extra paint, plot pane here to make things a little easier. So I'm going to put the clear signal up top upstairs and then let's also put the Q output upstairs. Okay, great. And so what we see here is that the data and the clock are essentially right on top of one another. But if we zoom in really, really far, what we'll notice is that the data transitions from zero to a one, and then sometime later, the clock transitions from zero to one. And then way over here, I zoomed in a little too much, uh, zoom to fit, and then way over here, yeah, so what happens, let's, let's get a, f a feel for the time frame here. So uh, data transitions from zero to one. Again, this part has no setup and hold time requirement. Whatever the input is uh, at the rising clock edge, that's what gets clocked to the output. And remember, I set the delay to some number of nanoseconds and after that time, the output transitions high. So now let's reverse this relationship. I want the clock to go high before the data goes high. And the way I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna adjust these parameters. And I'm going to say the data delay, I'm gonna make it a nanosecond and my clock delay a picosecond, which is effectively zero. And now let's see if we clock in zeros. So let's run that again. And sure enough, we can see that this green trace, this Q stays low. And if we zoom in, we see that sure enough, the clock rises at, yeah, so the clock rises first and then sometime later the data rises to zero. And uh, noting these slopes here, it looks like I might have uh, messed up my slopes a little bit. Oh yeah, so I've got the, um, the slopes, the, the rise and fall times are 100 picoseconds here, and it looks like I forgot to do that downstairs uh, on the clock delay. So let's go rise time is 100 picoseconds, and fall time is 100 picoseconds, and then let's run that again. Okay, great. And then sure enough, if we zoom in, yeah, so both... Yeah, so the rise times are equal here. Uh, and then let's go back one more time and reverse that relationship and see if we can clock in clock in ones. So my data delay is one picosecond and my clock delay is one nanosecond. Okay, so we'll run that again. And yeah, back where we started. Now that our rise times are equal. Yeah, so one nanosecond before the clock edge, the data goes high and the output after the prop delay of the flip-flop transitions high again. Um, and then, you know, just for fun, let's drop the data, let's drop the propagation delay of this guy. And we're going to drop it from, 
the delay instead of 12 nanoseconds, let's make it two nanoseconds. And our expected behavior is wherever that clock edge happens, two nanoseconds later, the this edge comes in here. And we can actually measure that in LT Spice. So if I do this, I notice on the bottom of the screen, my DX is about 14 nanoseconds, right? So 12 or 14, depending on where, I guess it starts right, yeah, so the rising edge starts right around 12 nanoseconds after the clock edge. Okay, so let's see if, let's see if we've effectively changed that here to two nanoseconds. Uh, let's run that again, and let's zoom in. Zoom in again, zoom in even more. And yeah, so sure enough, our data goes high, one nanosecond later our clock goes high, and two nanoseconds later is where our output edge uh, starts to, where our flip-flop output starts to rise. So you get the idea. We've got very fine, a fine degree of control over the behavior of this ideal flip-flop. And let's go and let's go play with that divider again. And just to convince ourselves we know how this circuit works. So here I've got a clock coming in and, and I sort of set the duty cycle of the clock, not 50%. Uh, and I sort of did that on purpose. So I'm gonna run this again and uh, let's clear out all of these guys. So uh, let's see, so that's F5 to clear that. Let's clear our data and we want to keep our clock signal Let's get rid of Q and I'm gonna probe clock div two. Um, and then let's add a plot pane and then move clock div two up here. Yeah, so this shows what's going on. So a clock pulse comes in uh, and then, you know, for fun, let's just show, show the behavior of the clear signal as well. So if we show clear, we start out clearing the flip-flop, then we release clear so that, um, we release clear so that the you know the flip flop operates as normal, and the first rising clock edge that comes in, my output goes high, and then remember the output of um, of the clock of of clock div two is the opposite of Q bar. And actually, let's probe that. So um, you know here we can see the teal trace starts out high and then goes low, and uh, and, and vice versa. Uh, let's add a plot pane here once again just to make things a little clearer. Okay, there, so it's called uh, node one, but it's really the, the complementary output here. So what this says is the first clock edge that comes in, my clock goes high, and what I'm doing is the complementary output, which again is fed back to data, is set up for a zero. So the very next clock edge that comes in, clocks in a zero, and so on and so on. Um, you see another uh, handy aspect of this circuit is it can take a non-50% duty cycle clock and turn it into a 50% duty cycle clock um, of, of half the frequency. So if duty cycle is important, this is a, a can be a handy circuit for, uh, for cleaning that up. Okay, so this is fantastic in simulation. I can go in here and make my perfect pulse generators and I can use that to slide timing relationships around. But how do I do that in real life? And let's see, save changes, sure, we can do that. And let's open up our next flip-flop pot timing. Okay, so here is what we're going to do in real life. So um, creating very fine uh, timing adjustments in real life can be pretty difficult. Um, we have our AD ALM 2000 at our disposal, uh, but that the pattern generator on that device is operates at 100 megahertz. So that sounds fast, but that's a 10 nanosecond um, that, that's a 10 nanosecond timing resolution. And our flip-flops have set up and hold time requirements that are less than 10 nanoseconds. You know, we ideally we would want one nanosecond or, or 100 picoseconds or even 10 picoseconds of timing resolution in order to really dig in and play with that relationship. So here's what we're gonna do in real life. We're going to take that clock signal and drive the center tap or the, the wiper of a 1K potentiometer. And what that's going to do is it will work against the input capacitance of the flip of the flip flop, which is typically, you know, three points so and so uh, picofarads here. And um, that'll create a small delay. And depending on where the wiper is positioned, it will um, skew the delay between the data and the clock. And so I've set this simulation up to parameterize the position of the potentiometer. So I'm going to step it from 20 to 30 to 40 to 50, 60, 70, 80% of, um, of the position here. So let's run this and see what happens. 
Okay, so if if we run it over and over again, oh, and, and sure enough, I've also created a clear signal. So let's probe that as well. Yeah, so again, the, the clear signal starts out high and then asserts low. So it's really this first clock edge where we wanna see what is happening. And if we zoom in far enough and let's get rid of our clear signal, then remember the red trace is our is our Q output. What we see is that for some of the rising edges, and it's kind of hard to see because the colors are the same here, but until that wiper passes 50%, we're clocking in a zero, and then eventually we clock in a one. And then if we look at the if we look at the um, the timing relationship that we have here. Let's zoom in pretty far, or as far as we can stand it here. So I have set up the flip-flop here with a transition, um, sorry, with a threshold of two and a half volts. So that's right in here. So what that tells us is, let's measure this delay. So this is a DX. This is a two nanosecond delay. And, and that's about, that sort of makes sense, right? I've got a one, a 1000 ohm, potentiometer and I've got about three or four picofarads of input capacitance. So a pico times a kilo is a nano. So this gives me that really fine timing resolution to go in there and play with this thing in real life. Okay, and um, let's take a pause here and, uh, and I'll pull up the camera and show you what this thing looks like in real life. Okay, so here's a quick tour of the circuit in real life. And um, this was the first uh, revision that I built up here. And um, it actually started out a, a lot simpler than this. So there's a, a lot of extra stuff here that we'll talk about in a second. But here's my potentiometer. And I've uh, wired that to the clock and the data inputs of a 74HC74 flip-flop. It's actually uh, not in the socket right now. So I wanted to put a socket here so I could test out different devices and, and all that. Um, now, one of the things that will want to do eventually is is play around with the, those timing relationships automatically and so we'll, we'll I guess we'll, we'll start right in with an explanation of that um, so there's a lot of different ways to um, adjust the timing of a signal here but I already had this potentiometer and so what if I could um, find a way to adjust this electronically well I could put a motor and uh, like a little gear motor on this thing to turn it um, uh, mechanically but uh, that is sort of inelegant here so what I did instead was I um, I was thinking back to application note 43 uh, where uh, they used a, a vactrol which is a, a, a an electronically variable resistance. And what it is, is it's a, um, it's a photocell. So a cadmium sulfide photocell, uh, very common in sort of um, like, like your outdoor lighting that turns off automatically at night. And uh, it's you know, basically a resistance that changes in response, to, uh, in response to light. And what we're gonna do is we're going to shine an LED on, that, uh, on the photocell, and now we have an electronically variable resistance. And you can actually buy this in a box or as a component. Uh, there's a company called VacTech that makes uh, things called Vactrols. And uh, so here's an old, really old device. I guess there's no date code on it, um, but it's a, it says VacTech Vactrol, and in here somewhere is a cadmium sulfide resistor and probably an incandescent light. Um, some more modern versions of that. So here's another Vactrol, and you know, sure enough, it says Vact VacTech Vactrol, and it's labeled lamp on one side and cell on the other side with no polarity. Um, so I haven't tested this, but this leads me to believe that it is a, an incandescent bulb. Um, and then a slightly more modern version are these little guys here. And so this says cell on one side and LED on the other and the polarity is marked. Uh, I tried uh, sanding down the side of one of these things and it was uh, kind of anticlimactic. It uh, looks like it, it's potted pretty well. Uh, and I, um, I, I sent some current through this and measured the voltage drop. And, and I think it's an infrared LED because you couldn't really see anything. Uh, now, in contrast, the LEDs I'm using are, uh, are, are red. So uh, you will be able to see this crazy thing in operation. Okay, so while we're at it, let's let's just run a quick test so we can convince ourselves that these things actually work as advertised. So if we look at the multimeter here, it's reading about 200 and 280 ohms in sort of ambient light here. And if I put my hand over the photocell, I re reach you know 1K and and 
further and further. And these things are, are quite sensitive. So if I really put my hand around it, you know, 28, 30 K. So the resistance is very high uh, in the dark and it is um, considerably lower in the, um, you know, when, when light strikes it. So um, on the board here that I built up, so I've, I've actually glued the, the photo cell to the LED and I took some measurements. So I ran uh, a milliamp through the assembly here, and I measured the two devices here. So, you know, I, with a milliamp, I have about 1K, two milliamps, about 0.7 or 0.5K on this other device here. And, and the reason I did this is I wanted to be able to take do a linear regression and uh, put this actual behavior into LT Spice. Um, and then I actually rebuilt this circuit again with some additional features involved here. Um, and we'll show a, 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 an LT Spice simulation as well. I wanted the ability to either inject a, um, a, a pure clock and data signal into the flip-flop or uh, a signal using this uh, automatic control circuit here. Um, I also wanted very sharp edges at the input of my flip-flop. So I've got an intervening OR gate that basically gives me uh, all of the controllability that I want. So let's look at that in LT Spice uh, to make it a little bit more clear. So here is that first rendition of the circuit. So uh, I took the circuit that we just simulated with the uh, with with the one k potentiometer, and I've added resistors uh, in parallel with both sides here. Um, and then uh, the rest of the circuit is the same here. I've got the input capacitance of the flip flop, and then what I do is the following. So how do I how do I figure out the timing relationship that causes the output to go wonky here? Well, the output of the flip flop should be either zero zero or five volts or whatever my logic high voltage is. So I'm going to build a circuit that says, you know what, I want the output to be half that to two and a half volts. And of course, the flip flop can't do that. Its only choices are zero volts or five volts. So the idea is to make a circuit that forces the output to an average of uh, two and a half volts. So sort of to flip back and forth between a zero and a one. So the way I do that is I built a little error integrator here with a um, with a two and a half volt reference. And, uh, and and I basically, if if my Q output is, is, too, is too low, then my V trim, the output of the integrator is going to ramp up and I'm going to send more current through uh, one of these red LEDs. And I'm just using 4148s as, uh, as placeholders here. And um, I could have, like I say in the uh, in the note here, uh, I could have probably just used one of these, but I kind of like the symmetry of using two. So whatever V trim does, if V trim uh, increases, then I send more current through this lower LED and less current through this upper LED. Um, and then both of these are wired in parallel with my um, with my potentiometer. And uh, I'm using Q bar here just because of the way the polarities work out. Okay, so let's uh, run this and, and see if we get our see if we get our expected behavior. Uh, so let's see, we're going to run. Okay, and then the first thing, let's get our clock signal on board here. And um, it's it's messy, right? Because we're, we're simulating for a long time period and we've got a fairly clock uh, fast clock signal here. So let's add a plot pane and then let's plot our Q output. And check this out. It's I start out high and then eventually I start flip-flopping back and forth between zero and one. And let's look at what the output of our error integrator is doing as this is happening. So error integrator integrator starts out at zero volts and then my Q output is high, which is, yeah, so Q, Q is high, Q bar is low. And so that means my V trim is going to start ramping up. I'm going to send more current through the LED. I'm going to decrease the resistance of this arm of the potentiometer, which is going to pull the clock signal uh, in. So less delay on the clock signal, more delay on the data signal. And uh, let's, let's zoom in and see if we can get any sort of clarity on what's going on here. And it is, it's kind of hard to see exactly what's going on but you know let's let's see if we can get a um, some idea okay so I is oh so I probe this clock signal let's probe or clock in let's probe clock and data and see if we yeah okay actually this is what we want to see so here's clock and data and sure enough my clock rises and my data rises yeah that's not quite showing what I want it to um, we'll have to dig in a little bit further here and see, let's see if we see any difference between when we clock in a zero. Okay, so here the teal rises first when I go high. 
let's zoom back out. Let's find a uh, let's find a high to low transition. So teal was first. Let's see if pink was first here. Yeah, teal again. I'd have to kind of use my imagination here, and and that could just be a quirk of the flip flop here. Again, we're dealing with ideal components, and we're trying to explore non ideal behavior. Um, okay, so we're going to look at that on the scope in a second here. But what I wanted to do next is open up my complete schematic just so that we don't get confused. Uh, and by the way, I'm going to put all of these up on GitHub and uh, so you'll have access to those. Uh, so I've got Metastabilizer Vactrol and Metastable Vactrol, Vactrol Full. So here are those extra features that I was talking about before. Um, so again, I want the ability to either enable this wonky circuit or inject um, pure signals. So a, a pure clock and a pure data signal here. And the first thing I want to do with this single flip-flop is I, I don't want to mess with it. I want to measure the propagation delay from data to output. Uh, I want to see what things look like when they're operating correctly. Uh, and the way I do that is I take the Q-bar output and I feed it back into this, this OR gate, which then propagates straight through to the data and, and every Everybody's happy. Um, and then what do I do here? Oh, so the clock is coming into the clock signal, and I basically have that divide by two situation going on. Um, I also have the ability to move a jumper to, uh, to basically enable this circuit. And so let's, let's actually run this. So the first thing we're going to do in real life is set up our divide by two. So let's run this. Oh, and I guess I had this set up already. So my clock in is a certain frequency and my clock out is uh, that frequency divided by two. So a rising edge causes my Q output to rise, my, my Q bar output to fall, and then the next clock edge comes in, I have that divide by two situation here. So this will let me look at rising edges and falling edges on my oscilloscope and convince myself that the flip-flop is operating properly. And then let's go in and let's move our jumpers so F7 down here, and then we'll move this here. Um, and I'm not sure whether I'm not sure whether the um, the inputs to these flip flops are. Oh no, I sorry, I did. Yeah. So I've got pull down resistors on the inputs of the flip flops. Um, LT Spice might automatically pull these low, but in real life, if I float the inputs to these gates, they could be high or low and all kinds of bad stuff can happen. So I've got a pull down resistor on the unused inputs and uh, same thing happens with my potentiometer. So when my potentiometer is, um, is, is yeah, so when, when I'm connected to, oh gosh, what am I doing here? Yeah, oh yeah, so whenever my, I, um, Whenever I don't drive the clock in signal to the center of my potentiometer, I've got a pull down resistor as well. Okay, so let's uh, let's run some let, let's run this simulation with that meta stabilizer enabled, and I should see that same behavior. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so let's get rid of my uh, my data signal. Uh, let's see, let's cut this out of here, and I have that same behavior, right? So the clock comes in. And my clock is continuous as my trim signal, as my V trim signal increases, eventually I reach that point where I start banging back and forth between a zero and a one. Okay, let's play with this silly thing in real life. Okay, so here's a um, here's an overview of the hardware setup. Um, I've got my ADALM2000 acting as a, a power supply and a clock source. So it's actually not doing not doing an awful lot here. We're not using any of its really advanced features and all that. Um, but what I'm doing is I'm piping a clock input into my uh, my auxiliary uh, OR gate input. That clock propagates through and you know, feeds the clock of the uh, flip-flop directly. Then I take the Q bar output and I feed it back uh, into the D input. So again, this is to set up that, um, this is to set up the, uh, the the divide by two action. So we can look at the propagation delay through the, through the D flip-flop here. And you'll notice that the LED is orange. And let me see if I can stop that real quick. So if I pull off the clock, uh, it'll go red. And then if I put it back on again, I can get the right one here. It goes back to orange, so red. 
So if I can get this, yeah, and then I can stay green. Um, so the uh, a red green bicolor LED, if you flip it back and forth really fast, uh, sort of is perceived as orange. So let's plug this back in again, and uh, let's look at this on the oscilloscope. Okay, so here's what this thing looks like on the scope. So on channel one, I've got my clock signal, and on channel two, I've got the the Q output of the flop here. And so sure enough, what you'll notice is that the the clock signal is at one frequency, and uh, let's see, it's a 10, 10 microsecond period, so 100 kilohertz, and then my, uh, my Q output is divided by two effectively. And if I do a single shot a couple of times here, you'll notice that sometimes in the center of the screen, I catch a rising edge, and sometimes I catch a falling edge. And that's super handy for getting a picture of both propagation delays. So I'm just going to set this thing to run. And uh, sure enough, we have a blur in the top of the screen here. But let's, let's keep zooming in. And what we'll notice here is on our rising clock edge, sometime after the rising clock edge, sometimes we see a rising edge and sometimes we see a falling edge on the on the data output. And so what I'm going to do is set up my screen for infinite persistence. So we'll do delay and persistence time is now infinite. Okay. And so this gives us a this gives us a picture of what that propagation delay looks like over time. And yeah, it's interesting how it appears yeah it appears to be synchronized somehow. Okay, and then let's put up some cursors here and measure that propagation delay. So let's see, cursors, let's do, uh, we want a, we want an X cursor and, yeah, okay, so AX, so we're going to put that right at the rising edge of the, of the clock signal, and then the B cursor, oops, there's, B, we'll put that right at our transition here. Actually, let's let's zoom in a little for, for some finer resolution. Okay, so B, and then we'll put A at this rising edge. And let's see, so the delta X is about 15 nanoseconds. So let's keep that number in mind. We've got about a 15 nanosecond propagation delay. Doesn't matter if I'm transitioning from high to low or low to high, it's about the same. Alrighty, we're in the home stretch. So um, first, let's uh, we're going to reconfigure our circuit to test out this little potentiometer scheme here uh, to see if we if we can vary the timing between our data and clock. So we've got the same clock signal coming in, and we're going to skew the delay a little bit here. And uh, what I'm probing on the oscilloscope is the two ends of the potentiometer, which we'll expect to see sort of an exponential increase. And I'm also probing the output of the OR gates. And you'll see what I mean. We've got smeary signals uh, on at least one end of the potentiometer, and we've got nice square signals at the input of the flip-flop. Uh, so this circuit would work without these OR gates in here, but I wanted to have a nice, easy-to-measure uh, timing relationship between data and clock on the flip-flop itself. So if we go over to the oscilloscope here, I've got this up and running. And so what we're seeing here is on channel one, uh, I don't know if that's clock or data, it doesn't matter, we're going to smear them both ways. Uh, so channel one is the input, one of the inputs to the flip-flop, either D or Q. Uh, channel two is uh, the other input, and then channel three and channel four are the two ends of the potentiometer. And what we're going to do is turn the pot. And sure enough, you can see if I turn it all the way one direction, the, uh, the purple trace, uh, channel three there, which uh, corresponds to, looks like it must correspond to channel one, uh, is a nice sharp edge. And channel four, oops, is a is uh, fairly smeared out. So I've got maximum resistance on channel four and minimum resistance or zero on channel three. And then if I turn the pot the other direction, then sure enough, I go the other completely the other way. I've got the um, I've got a nice sharp edge on channel four, and then a smeary edge on channel three. Now you'll notice all the wigglies on the traces here, and um, I could have done a better job probing. Uh, that is a rabbit hole for another day. I am just using my 350 megahertz scope probes with their ground clips, so I've done as good as I can 
connected all the ground clips to a fairly solid ground on the board, uh, but again, it could be better. Okay, so, you know, again, so now I have the ability to skew the timing. It looks like about yeah, 40 nanoseconds in this direction and 60 nanoseconds or so, maybe about, uh, no, I guess it's, it's pretty symmetrical. So 40 in, 40 or 50 in either direction. Ah, perfect. Okay, great. So now I'm going to take the probe off of uh, one, I'm going to take the probes off of the potentiometer because that is less important now. And let's look at the output of the flip-flop. So I'm looking at the Q output here on the pink channel. And it's low, so I'm going to turn off channel 4 because it's uh, just a distraction at the moment. And let's see what happens. So here at some... Oh, there it goes high. So here I've got the clock on... Is that right? Yeah, so I've got the, it looks like I've got the clock on channel two and the data on channel one. And you see right around when they're almost, almost coincident is where the output flips from left to right. So here I'm clocking in a one. Uh, yeah, so clearly the yellow trace is the data because if I skew too far, I'm setting up for a one and then I clock in a one. And then here, if I back off my data, here my data is zero and I clock in a zero. Yeah, so again, the blue trace is the data and this is the clock. Wow, how cool is that? So let's reconfigure the circuit for the closed loop control here. So I'm going, what I'm going to do is uh, bring the, set this jumper back in place, set this jumper back in place. Oh, and I wanted to show you one other thing that I uh, neglected to mention earlier is uh, these numbers in my resistor. How did I set up a variable resistance in LT Spice? Um, so I did show you the data that I took earlier on the LED current versus cadmium sulfide cell resistance. And what I did was I, I turned that into admittance because it's a little easier to plot and the math is a little easier. And I plotted these guys. I did a best fit straight line and took the average. And I ended up with an average intercept of uh, 00628 and a slope of 0.428 or so. So what I did was I entered those numbers into my resistance, uh, except one over, so in reciprocal here. So uh, 0006 plus 0.5, uh, sorry, 0.425 times whatever the LED current is. So not perfect, but for uh, the purposes of the simulation, it's all good. Okay, so I've got the variable resistors um, or the... the um, cadmium sulfide cells connected. I've disconnected my extra signals because I want this to be the only source of my clock. And uh, let's see, what am I probing? I'm still probing the data and the clock and I'm probing the Q output. Um, the one other point that will that is very interesting to look at is the control signal here. So uh, so is this signal holding at a nice steady voltage like it is in, uh, in LT Spice or does it do something else in reality? Okay, so if we come over here to the oscilloscope, I've got uh, no persistence on, and you know, sure enough, you can see that uh, I've got um, I, I've got the clock and data. Oh, and I um, I, I swapped the signals here, so the the yellow trace is steady, and you can sort of see the circuit controlling the uh, controlling the timing of the blue trace. So the blue trace is sort of smearing back and forth. Uh, so let's see. So in infinite persistence, persistence, we don't see much, maybe a hint of something going on around mid-screen, but let's turn persistence time on to the maximum and see what we get. Okay, and that is what we're looking for here. And let's get our cursors in place. Uh, Oh, I guess I can move with my finger here. So we'll put our A cursor right at the clock and our B cursor here. Uh, I'm still trying to reconcile this extra, um, this extra delta X. It looks like it's about 40 nanoseconds or so is where most of my transitions occur. But if we sit here and wait, look at this. Occasionally, we get transitions that extend out 60 nanoseconds. Let's wait for a couple more seconds and see if we get one further. Wow, look at that. Okay, so there's another one. And yeah, so if we just sit here, we end up with, we end up seeing metastability in action. So it's manifesting itself as an extra propagation delay through this uh, circuit. And the last node that we're gonna look at here is the output of the error amplifier. And if I look at that, look at that smear of this blue here. And when I first saw this, I thought I was going crazy. I thought it was instability or something like that. And, um, but if we zoom out, we can see exactly what's going on. Okay, further, 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 real far. Okay, and then uh, let's turn off persistence. 
Uh, let's see, persistence back to minimum. Okay, and then I'm going to shrink my clock and data to sort of get them out of the way a little bit. Okay, and then look at what's going on here. So my error amplifier is banging back and forth in concert with the output. And what this is, is it is a, um, it's the difference in setup and hold time requirements for a rising edge or for clocking in a zero versus clocking in a one. Um, so I think that's the explanation. I still need to dig in a little bit, um, a little bit further. Um, but yeah, so so now we've seen it. Uh, meta stability in action, and uh, boy, this, uh, my friends, is the strangest circuit I've ever designed and built. Um, so I hope you learned something about flip flop timing, and um, yeah, keep this in in the back of your mind the next time you're connecting up a uh, spy device to a microcontroller or something like that.